Well, here we are, final session of 20. <laughs> and I'm still laughing maniacally. So welcome tonight to the last session of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. And what a session, um, what, a, what a couple of weeks of sessions we've had, actually. I was just saying to these guys before I hit record, you know, how amazing uh, and varied the talks have been and uh, just really enjoyed all of them actually they've all been really exciting and just overwhelmed by how much insight information and wisdom people are prepared to impart so um so yeah so thank you for that so far now tonight it's a different format to usual we thought we'd have a little twist at the end um and so i am actually off the hook tonight i get to be in the audience tonight which is really nice um apart from my intro at the beginning and a quick summary at the end and I'm going to hand over to Roxy, who is the BFI Network Talent Executive at Film Hub North. And her mission is to discover, develop and champion new talent in writing, directing and producing. And prior to joining BFI Network, Roxy worked at screen agency Northern Film and Media as, and as a freelance producer. Over the course of her career, she has commissioned and executively produced more than 40 short films and documentaries, including 14 random acts for Channel 4. Roxy has also devised and delivered numerous talent development and digital innovation programs in partnership with broadcasters and film development agencies. And so tonight, Roxy's going to chair the session. Um, we're going to be talking around the building blocks of story. So we've gone all over the place around XR and AI and lo lots and lots of technologies. But we thought at the end, we bring it back to the fundamentals of the building blocks of story. And this will be a session covering the traditional fundamentals of story development and how when these essentials are in place, they can be applied across any platform, not only film and TV, but social media, video games, because the principles are the same. And the angle is that we, we know that these foundations are here to help creatives better connect with audiences, no matter what platform they choose to tell their stories on. But don't worry, Robbie, there's still going to be chance for questions at the end. So um, so you're not off the hook yet. And then at, right at the end, I'll just say a quick thank you to everyone and wrap up the festival. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Roxy and to our guests to introduce our guests. And I'll see you guys at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Heather. That's great. And uh, hi to everybody. As Heather said, my name is Roxy. I'm a BFI Network Talent Exec at Film of North. I'm really pleased to be joined by Roger Hyams and Beth McCann. Uh, Beth is a lecturer in screenwriting and a script consultant. She runs Scriptwriting North, which is an independent hub for new emerging and professional screenwriters. And her ongoing PhD research explores the writer's process of adapting feature film scripts into long form narratives. And we have Roger. Roger is a writer, director, script editor and teacher. After 12 years as an actor, he joined the BBC as a script editor in television and film. And before going freelance, was head of development in drama at Talkback Productions. Roger is also a visiting lecturer on the London Film School Screenwriting MA. So welcome, Roger and Beth. Thank you so much for joining us today. So what, obviously, this is a session getting right back down to the basics and fundamentals of, of, of storytelling. And I just wanted to first start by establishing what we mean by the building blocks of story. Um, and if I can go to you first, Beth, when we talk about the building blocks of story, what are the kind of key elements that we're discussing? And I know we'll probably go into more detail about each one, but kind of when you think about building blocks of story, what are the, are the kind of headline words that come into your head? I think for me, like the first thing I always think about, and I think people will approach it in different ways in terms of what's important to me. But for a building block, I'm always thinking about, okay, whose who's story is it that we're thinking about? Um, kind of what is the story? <laughs> because I sometimes think there's a difference between thinking of concepts regard, right, rather than story. So thinking about kind of whose story is, what that story is, and what's kind of the pull and the payoff. So for me, those are kind of like the key initial thoughts and then maybe kind of the other thing I'll be thinking about is kind of uh, what it's about and underneath that I'd always be thinking about structure <laughs> which is that thing that people don't like to always talk about um but is kind of for some people uh innate we're thinking about naturally a beginning a middle and an end um and how we kind of approach them so they would be my, my main kind of things of which you might approach in any different kind of order for me, they'd be the first things I'd think of, maybe. 
And would you say, Roger, there's anything there that you would add that you feel also should be mentioned when we're talking about those kind of fundamental building blocks? No, I think I think if we're talking about um, uh, story across different media, then I think I think Beth uh, summed it up beautifully. Um, I would just add that I'm very glad to hear her start with who's it about because i think that's something that's very very often and perhaps surprisingly as a result of that sinister thing called structure lost in the process so maybe we can come back to that as we as we talk further and that will actually kind of leads me on to the, my next question which was around which element is the most important and I think you probably, Roger, you just said there, do you think that is the most important element that, that someone has to consider when they're starting to think about story? I think it is, yes. Because I think um, perhaps Beth, uh, and, and uh, you know, we work together, Roxy, so I know that, you know, we all have different terminologies for these things. For me, I tend to think in terms, and this is not something I invented, but somebody once defined it this way for me and I found it very useful that narrative is what happens and story is who it happens to or who's making it happen and so in that respect it seems to me that if you don't know whose story it is then actually you could almost say you don't know what story it is because in the, you know, that an audience might not immediately be aware of that because they may well be thinking, particularly in long form pieces, what's going to happen next? And oh, there's an interesting twist. But that desire is always hitched to the desire for something good or possibly bad to happen to a particular character. So, yes, I, I think it's paramount. That's interesting, obviously, that we talk about point of view and we talk and, and it all can come back to comes back to character. Just kind of diving a bit deeper into character. Mm. What Beth, if I can go to you, what what is it about a character? Aside from obviously we it's the person that we see the story through, it's their point of view. Um, what is it that makes a, a compelling character for the screen? And what elements do they have to have in order to become that kind of linchpin of the story? I think there's so many things that we can think about in terms of what makes a, a great character um, and why we um, connect with a character. But as a real basic kind of principle, I always think we've got to identify what they want. <laughs> Because if we don't know what they want, and I think when I work with a lot of writers, they'll have maybe a really interesting character that, you know, is is flawed and has a really interesting backstory. But, you know, we, we're often watching characters moving forward in whatever sense, right? That they're, they're doing something. And in order to, to find and, and to watch them, we've got to know, they might not know what it is, but we've got to know what they want. They're, they're trying, we're, we're pulling us, you know, towards something. Um, so, so ultimately, I think that, you know, we can really talk about the kind of construction of character and how we might explore character. But you are you are exploring them on some kind of a journey. And in, in terms of having that journey, they, they need to want something and, and they need to need something as well. And I always, I always think about need as the thing that the character really doesn't know. <laughs> they really don't know what they need, um, but they might know what they want. And they're two very, very different things. Um, and identifying what triggers that to make that happen, you know, to identify whatever that goal is, you know, the story starts then, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, otherwise we're just kind of watching characters potentially just float around. Um, and, it might be and, lovely. <laughs> and when you kind of, and um, Rogers, and when you think about character in terms of moving, uh, when you think about different kind of forms or platforms, and I know we've had many discussions about um how many characters you have in a short versus a feature and and how we have to stay focused on on one character's journey are there any um 
particular rules that you think people have to follow dependent on the platform or the form that they're using to tell a story in relation to character? Well, I think, uh, you know, in, I wouldn't describe them as rules exactly. I, I guess I would think of them as rules of thumb, helpful handholds. You know, if you're talking about, um, well, for example, about theatre, you, you know, broadly speaking, unless it is, for example, immersive theatre or it's, uh, you know, a, a very specific format, in that in that area basically the audience is at a fixed relationship physically to all the people on stage and so uh knowing who you're following becomes very important and then knowing how to follow them is a matter of the theatrical form and i, I think it it's worth going back to theater given that it astonishingly you know, it predates even cinema. Um, and the ways that that has been done historically has been very, have been very different, you know, from the soliloquy, the direct address, to the way that you see it in 19th century, early 20th century, uh, uh, naturalistic theatre, where it's partly about who's on stage more of the time and therefore you're naturally going to follow them. And in a sense, I think that's been the model for cinema and then television. How it then translates into um, uh, interactive work is an, an interesting question. And maybe, maybe that's something Beth might be more knowledgeable about than I am. But I certainly think that in in a way it's about um well, it's a huge question, so I'm going to try to give it a a, a kind of very broad brushstroke answer, which is to do with um how you focus on the main wavelength, if you like, so if you've got an orchestral piece like Magnolia or in a different way, Pulp Fiction. Uh, that's about orchestrating different instruments for which read characters in a way that they interplay complexly but clearly. Whereas if you're dealing with a feature uh, that, that is only 90 minutes or then down to a 15 or 10 minute short, the scope for how many people you can keep in play at the same time becomes tighter and tighter. You notice again that I'm not making definitive statements because I know it is possible to stretch any of those forms. But I do think that knowing what the forms are in the first place is incredibly helpful so that you then know what you're stretching. I think that's it, isn't it? I think it's, it's it's a lot of people say that it's good to obviously know the rules, but then then you're able to break them, to bend them, to yeah. to kind of play and experiment with them. When and Beth, when you're kind of reading scripts, and I know you do a lot of kind of script development work and script editing work, when you give feedback, which what element tends to be the one that keeps recurring as a problem? Which part, which building block, kind of stirs up the most issues for writers that you keep coming back to um is there a particular one that particularly stands yeah. out in an early draft when i'm first kind of I, I think for me sometimes i think okay one of the building what i see a lot in an early draft maybe with a kind of a newer writer will be one of the first questions i'll, I'll, I'll ask them before we talk about the script to be like what's what story are you telling and then when I look at the script, I'd be like, okay, when do we start telling that story? Um, so for, for me, that building block then, beyond kind of um, thinking about character and who the story is about, they might have a really clear sense of that. It then starts to come for newer writers, sometimes about structure 
as a building block kind of going actually when do I start telling that story um and and what's the best way into that story and then we can then you know we get into other areas of building blocks about following that narrative developing like the escalation of it and and so forth potentially but yeah as a, as a first thing that I'm looking for when I'm looking at the start of a script it, wh where's that hook in I think because for, for me sometimes it can be when we're thinking about character and especially if they're leading with that they might feel like they need to and it's a word I don't really like using but it's, it's taught a lot is it's, they've got to set up <laughs> um and I think once we set up we like stop and try and tell who our character is rather than kind of showing and pulling them in and going right come with us come watch this person getting loads of trouble or whatever it might be um so I would say that's the first step of the building block in terms of when I read a script it's interesting that you talk about structure and obviously that is one of the fundamental areas to look at and there's lots of different um, language and technical talk about structure. There's three act, there's five act, the inciting incident, the climax, etc. And it can be a bit, I guess, um, kind of writing by the book. Um, I think sometimes perhaps that's helpful for writers starting out. But how how much do writers need to stick to the rules in order to write a good story? And I know we touched on that with you, Roger, there about kind of in relation to character, but in overall relation to structure, are those rules there for a good reason? Sorry, you're asking me, Roxy? Yes, yeah. I to stomp in. Um, I don't think they're rules. I think they are um, a set of things that people have come to notice repeatedly and so they've begun to take on the status of rules and I think you know if you think of some of the works of art that please you most that you revere most they don't they don't conform to the rules very well if at all um you know and I'm not just talking about radical pieces like, uh, you know, Antonio Antonioni's La Ventura, where one of the central characters leaves the film and never comes back. Um, I, you know, those are fascinating. But, um, I, I mean, in, incredibly moving films and plays and television shows where all sorts of surprising, peculiar, disruptive, and sometimes downright bumpy things happen for the right instinctive reason. So I think in, in order to think of them as, to think of them as rules is a mistake, to think of them as useful, uh, huh, I wonder if we do need something to kick the story into action which we can call an inciting incident yeah but then there are lots of other you know sorry i'm, I'm as usual going to come up with examples you know you think of a film like like uh, tarkovsky's stalker nothing happens for ages you know a dog wanders in and as i remember wanders out again you know it, it's it's dead in the water in conventional terms but it isn't because all sorts of things are being told to you. But I don't, I, I, I think that in the end, to go, look, let's say that there are three acts. Let's say that you have a central point of view and that something, uh, as Beth says, you know, some, some kind of trouble has to befall your hero. That's a very good starting point, even if you start pushing at it and going, well, does it really? Does it? Or does it really have to happen on page 11 or whenever it's supposed to be? No, it doesn't. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a tension there as well, isn't there, between trusting the artist and the filmmaker mm. and looking at, and for commissioners, looking at their previous work and understanding yeah. that and giving them trust that they've got a vision and they and they're going to carry it out even if it breaks the rules. And it's knowing, I guess, as a script editor, when when you kind of when and where you pull and push that tension 
Would you agree, Beth, with, with what Roger said there about totally. structure? Totally. And I think, yeah, I totally agree. And I think exactly as Roger's saying, it isn't you have to do this. And sometimes we can read scripts that are kind of structurally by the book, sound as anything, and they hit everything at every point. But we'll come back to that thing about story or we might come back to to about character. And it's 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 I think when it comes back to the principles, it's knowing them in order to, as you say, break them, but knowing what you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing sometimes. It's asking that question, oh, you know, actually, I want them to spend time here for this reason and to explore this moment. And that might be the choice that I'm trying to kind of explore within this or challenge. Um, but having, having a sense of why you're doing that, for what purpose? I think that's quite an and sometimes it can be unconscious can't it people can do things and they didn't have a purpose and they didn't realize they were doing that and that's wonderful um but I think maybe I'm talking at the maybe the very start sometimes when you're trying to kind of grapple with where where to start that these principles actually can just help you guide you and then you can kind of play and no. do you think so that every, with every building block you can play do you, or do you think, um, for example, I mean, there's a lot of talk about genre rules and and how upending those tropes makes for better, better films, better work. But how much can you really play with the kind of rules of character? If you have a character with no wants and needs, or a character that doesn't change, is you know, is it is it is is there kind of certain things that are set in stone or not? Would you say, Beth? anything set in stone <laughs> um and it depends on the project i, th I think it's, it's it's always asking yourself questions about what are you asking maybe from your audience um you know what am i asking me to invest in if it was if we were talking about kind of genre or we're thinking about character what, what are you inviting me into um and that, that's sometimes what I'm kind of looking for when I'm talking to a writer, like play with that. And I think that, you know, we're talking about creative uh, work here. So I always hope that people will play and and through that play, discover something within their own work or their own voice or the way to tackle a character. But the rules of that, you know, we want think we want people to be creative, but I th I think they're a really great place to start. Just you know, I, th I always think about it thinking like any instrument. You know, you learn the chord sometimes first, and then you start jamming. So <laughs> you know, like so, it, it, that can be a way into it. Whereas if someone just threw that guitar at you, you'd be like, but maybe that might be the interesting way for some people. But that. That, that's one way that can get people kind of maybe to move from getting their ideas out of the head and maybe onto the page. I mean, thinking about um, uh, writers and, and how they kind of in, initially spark a, a story for any platform, mm -hmm. um, what do you think, I mean, what should come first? Character, theme, what it is you just want to say and then you grow something from that or story idea. Do, Roger, do you have any... You're going to say none of them. It doesn't matter, aren't you? But I mean, is there is there one well, you think well, works think it, best as a writer yourself? Well, I I think for me it comes from character every time, and I think broadly speaking, wherever you start, unless you are doing something that is very much a a, a quite a rigid genre piece, um it ends up having to come back to that in in very much the way that Beth described earlier on. I think, you know, just to deal with this rigid genre thing, you know, we don't expect, these days we sort of do a bit, but we don't really expect James Bond to change very much. You know, once the, the lineaments of that figure known as James Bond have been established you expect him to behave in a bondish way and you don't need to know whether the arch villain in a Bond film has daddy issues but for anything that is really a story about a person getting into trouble in one way or another 
you sort of do. So I think I think when you're looking at genre work, you know, particularly for example, still horror films are very, very um successful and, and popular. And uh there are there are subgenres in that. And we now know, you know, there's the I mean people talk in terms of the final girl and have done for years to the extent that there's a film called The Final Girl. Well, okay, then there's going to be a certain set of things that have to happen or your audience won't come. But that's a very, very different case uh, when you're when you're talking about a I guess what I would call a story as opposed to a narrative, where the narrative really is leading things. Um, but even then, you can you can stretch it. You know, I think of a film like It Follows, for example, where effectively it's starting from a genre perspective, but it's doing unsettling things with that genre partly by the the uh the story world that's set up and i think that's something that one a lot of people take a little bit for granted and don't quite um uh, uh factor in if you like is whether this is taking place in what we think of as consensus reality or whether it's taking place somewhere very psyched slightly skewed and it follows does take place somewhere very slightly skewed it looks like contemporary america for 2014 but actually there are little clues that something slightly off is happening and that works very well to unsettle us so that overall uh, overarching concept uh, i think can be very important well it's always very important but it's particularly significant in genre work. Yeah. And do you think that when, I suppose it, then we're sort of starting to lean into just talking about theme and, um, you know, what it is someone is actually trying to say in that kind of universal sense. Do you, Beth, when you're working with writers, do people come to you um, wanting to explore a kind of very big topic and then it's tra how they kind of, distill that into characters that we can actually in the story world that we can actually buy into definitely um and I, I see that more and more actually that people are kind of leading with a theme or, or something that's happening that, that's really kind of inspired them to want to write a story um but in terms i think i think it's so important thinking about theme i think it's hugely we're talking about kind of genre pieces. I think there's a real scope for kind of finding that unique way into um, a piece when we think about what it's really about. Um, and I often, you know, talk to people about why why do you want to tell this story? You know, what is it that you want to say? And and that gives you a real platform to be able to explore um, any kind of genre, any kind of uh, world, if you're thinking about what you want to say. Um, I sometimes think that is though <laughs> sometimes it, the the theme can be so huge so if you bring it back to like a short film for example people will have kind of huge themes or really important themes um and I'm always about kind of how do you narrow that down um and, and for me and everyone has different approaches into it I'm always thinking about the theme and narrowing it down into a question of some kind that you're going to explore <laughs> or just not nodding you know that you know, so if someone said it's goodness, this film is about love, <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, well, they're quite big. Um, you know, what is it about love that you're going to explore, and how are you exploring it? Are you making a statement about it? Are you asking a question to your audience about it? You know, are different. You know, if we were talking about kind of more of an ensemble, are we challenging it in different ways through different characters? Does that allow you into that kind of conversation about theme? So I think it, with any of it, it. it, it you come back to all of it at some point, no matter which way in you go. Um, but I think, you know, that theme, 
it, it, it's, it's really important if we think about long form narratives, then we might be thinking about the theme of the series, for example, but the episode would explore it in a different way. Each episode, even though the, the series is about power, let's say, huge theme. Um, but, but I think the more that you can dig into it, to really what it's about and how, if we go back to character, these characters allow you to explore this theme. That's kind of key. Um, otherwise, it, it can be kind of sometimes, the, 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 otherwise the project can sometimes just lead with the theme mm -hmm. and it ends up trying to just teach you a lesson <laughs> um, rather than, again, if we go back to telling us a story. You were not in there, Roger. Do you agree? Oh, completely. I mean, I think it's so often the case that one, you know, that we see things that are so nakedly about what they're about, as if it were, you know, and and often people say quite explicitly, it is an issue drama, and it's so um, diminishing to do that. That's why, you know, when you think about the best work of somebody like Ken Loach, for example, it it's about a person. You know, I remember when when My Name is Joe came out, and that, you have that line, My Name is Joe, before you even see him. And you'd never think, oh, it's a film about a recovering alcoholic. You think it's a film about a person called Joe. And that attempt to define selfhood against really what just about every other Ken Loach film is about. And, he, and you know, his, his is quite a, a, an important body of work to, to look at from that point of view, because when it leaks, and it does sometimes, it leaks didacticism. But when it doesn't leak, when it... In, in a film like My Name is Joe, it's intensely moving and funny and incredibly credible. And yet the political and social points are still coming across loud and clear, louder and clearer. That kind of leads me into something I was wanting to talk about, which is about um, a writer's voice. And, and, we, and there's a, often writers are told, write what you know. Um, and then you talk about Ken Loach, and obviously he's writing about kind of working class northern um, people and not necessarily his own lived experience. But how much do you how much would you um, how would you interpret the phrase write what you know? And how do you balance that with imagination? I'll go to you, Beth, for that. Tricky one. Um, <laughs> it is a tricky one. And I think. I think even if you're writing about something that's a lived experience for example there's there's different ways of looking at it so that can be very personal and a very personal piece but it's it's acknowledging that when it's a very lived experience that's a, and you're talking about your own that's one maybe experience that you might be talking about um for, for me when I'm when I'm talking to people about kind of what right what you know sometimes it's you know it's asking certain questions is it your story to tell um, that can be an important question to ask. But also it can be about wh where does maybe research come into it? You know, especially when I'm talking to different writers, it might be about what they an experience that they've experienced personally. It could be that they've, um, something they're really interested in and have done a huge amount of uh, research or consulting with other people as well, or got consultants working with them on a project. So it can be exploring it from a, a range of ways. Um, sometimes it can be about things that um, they don't know, right? Um, and and part of that research and, and, and exploration is through their imagination and, and creating a whole new world. But within there, you know, they're, they're certainly we go back to characters. It can be characters that are in, you know, a world that we've never seen before, but, you know, they're still informed by different things. Um, so I think there's a real there's a, there's a number of questions depending on the project in terms of that relationship between what you know firsthand, what you know in terms of research, and that other question around you know whose story is it that we're telling here, and and do we have kind of almost people who talk about the right to tell that story? So a few things. 
yeah so it's a balance isn't it and I think as mm -hmm. well as long as you've done the research as well I think that's one of the, the huge element I'd just like to add if anyone um in the audience has any questions please do pop them into the Q&A box and I can pull them out of there and and we'll go to those as well but just just to go to you and we, when we go, go back, winding back to kind of um to make sure we we hit all those building blocks and one thing we haven't really talked about is um conflict which is often named as one of the essential elements in story so Roger do you want to say something about could you say something about conflict and mm -hmm. is that essential is it an essential um part of the story process I think it is um but I think it's important for writers just as it's important to uh not to be daunted by the idea that there have to be rules you know I mean I've 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 had writers say to me I'm worried about my second act pinch uh, I think I don't know what that is but it sounds quite uncomfortable I just I, I I think you should stop worrying about it and think about what the character is doing and similarly I think that it's very often the case that the word conflict instantly amplifies itself into there has to be a fight or there has to be shouting or there has to be you know, hatred. And so often the conflict is internal. Mm. You know, it's, mm. do I want this or do I want that? Or I thought I wanted this, but as, as Beth pointed out, you know, there's this other thing, which might be the need, dragging me in a slightly different direction. So, you know, conflict is, is such a charged word. And yet, really, what it means is tension between different directions, if you like, and that can as easily take place inside your your protagonist as it can uh, between people. And um, would you add anything to that, Beth, or are you in complete agreement? Well, I certainly agree. I think, it, yeah, it comes it comes from ultimately from character, doesn't it? You know. It, you can place them in any kind of situation and it can be big and explosive, but unless it kind of has an impact um, and almost a consequence of some sort. Um, but yeah, there is, there's always a level of conflict that, that, we'll, that we explore. And that might be thematic, we talk about theme, it could be all different things. And we seem to have a, a lot of questions now, so um, I'll see if we can rattle through these. Um, a question from Robbie here. How is storytelling changing? Is it changing from the better for the better? Do you want to pick that up, Beth? Do you think storytelling's changing? Hmm. But so it, it depends on what context we're kind of talk, talking about, really. I think... Um, I don't know, do really. Expect, do you think people have different expectations now than, than perhaps, perhaps um, when they talk about kind of younger people um, perhaps wanting shorter, sharper content, faster paced, or do you think like the appetites are changing for the types of stories that we want to see? I think we're seeing a wider range of stories mm -hmm. about a wider range of people and themes that they, they bring up. Um, I think because we've got so many different platforms now, um, there's a whole, you know, you know four channels and five you know there was a certain shows that we we would see if we think of it in that context so I think you know I don't always believe in the I think about kind of sh short um, attention spans in that films are getting bloody lot like longer all the time aren't they like I'm always looking for the 90 minute film um and you know long form if we think about streaming platforms we're watching content for hours um, so I think in that sense, it's changing in terms of how we consume mm. um, narratives and, and stories. But also, I think in terms of, you're right, in terms of the, type, the, the difference of stories that we're, we're getting a much wider range. I don't know, Roger, do you, do you think it's changing? I, I think that's a very good analysis. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, you've got everything from TikTok to you know, the eighth season of something that has 
you know, 12 episodes in the season. Um, and I think the overall effect is if there is if there is a, a danger here, there's a sort of exhaustion that takes place uh, at both ends, you know, a kind of overstimulated exhaustion. But on the other hand, enormously good work is being done everywhere. I agree with Beth. I think it is beginning to um, splurge a bit. Uh, and I think, <laughs> you know, having having kind of uh, um, shouldered against the idea of rules the whole time, when I see it, uh, that a film is 90 minutes, I often get excited because I think, well, <laughs> that that implies a certain degree of discipline. Yes. Um, so <laughs> I think... I think that there is a tendency in some areas to become undisciplined formally. I won't mention any names, but I've watched a few series recently where I've thought there's areas in here that are beautifully nuanced drama and areas where it's just gags. Whole scenes where it's just a stick. And you shouldn't have been allowed to get away with that, but you have because there's so much and because maybe the executive producer is the star and stuff like that. So I think there's all sorts of uh, formal tropes turning up that are not necessarily encouraging, but I don't think that means that everything's going to the dogs either. I do think, though, it's it's interesting you mentioned TikTok and when we look at those different platforms um we still have to come back to the one the tiktoks that work the best are the ones with the strongest characters the ones oh. with conflict the ones that you know the what they mm -hmm. these are the ones that still compel us so those fundamental building blocks are still at play even in this kind of yeah. micro format and, uh, and i don't think it's a, a, a an accident that a film like after sun or a film like petite maman have been so, I mean, obviously, relatively limited way financially, but nevertheless, so successful. And they've been successful because they are short and clear and about very few people going through deeply emotional experiences. Now, just going back into the uh, questions, I think, I mean, there's one directed at you here, Beth, about how does authenticity affect the quality of a story? And I think we've kind of touched on that a bit with already with the um, talking about the writer's voice and write what you know. But do you think that authenticity gives a kind of extra level of meaning to a, a work? Um. Yeah, no, I think it's that balance again, really. It's got to feel authentic. <laughs> Um, you know, so um, you, you've got to be able to convey that 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 that, that sense of authenticity, and, and we do, do we is it, it come if we go back to a character like do we believe that character? Do we believe that world? Are we are we are we in there? And once we're in there and we're with you, um, then there's there's certain things that we will accept. Um, but but yeah, I think it's it's got to be there, and we we've got to be able to read it. Because I always think about reading it, because I'm going to read the script. You know, we've got to be able to read it and and believe it, even if it doesn't. You know, and that 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 means yeah. in all forms. You know, Harry Potter yeah. or you know sci-fi yeah. film, and um, we believe it. And how much do you think someone else has mentioned this? So I kind of wrap it into that previous question. But how much of yourself should be in a story if you're writing what you know? How much? Should you be allowing of your own, you know, I guess it's that you're exposing yourself and, and a writer's more vulnerable if they are writing too much to their own experience. Do you want to, do you want to come to that, Beth, or, or Roger, if you... I would, I would argue that you don't have, you give what you want. It doesn't, you don't yeah. only have to write about yourself. Mm. Um, we talked about imagination. You know, you can yeah. use that. You don't have to only write about things that you've experienced firsthand or that are about you. Um, there's going to be some of you within there in terms of 
your imagination and how you see the world maybe or what's inspired you it might not be your point of view but it might be what's inspired you to write the project I don't know about you, do you, I don't yes I think I think authenticity is a debate not a mm-hmm. fact exactly yeah and Roger, um, there's a question here that someone says, how does a writer um, gauge how uh, experimental and non-linear they can go with a script storyline when writing for a TV series, especially for a new writer with the intention for it to be broadcast by a TV network? Well, that's a tough question. It's a good question, but it, it, it seems to me that um, uh, in a way, it may not be the right question if you I, I, I have a suspicion that perhaps the person who has asked the question is thinking specifically about themselves and their own project. And, and if that's the case, I would say, you know, <laughs> write what you know, stick to your own authenticity and then see whether it works. I don't think it's a... Um, I don't think it's a, a the crest of a hill that you can try to navigate and not fall off. You need feedback to see whether the television company is saying to you, this is too weird, we can't do it, or this is refreshing, we really should do it. Let's preserve the, you know, the, the newness and interestingness of your voice. You know, we are seeing so much different and interesting stuff now uh, that we know it can happen. Uh, I I think the, you know, it, 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 in a way, it goes back to that previous question about how much of yourself you can use. I think as long as you are not damaging yourself, risking your mm, mental health or physical health in doing it then you as Beth says you always bring yourself to it you know Mm. where did that idea come from where did that character come from well it came from me I don't quite know how but you know that's exciting I'd also probably add to that last question about kind of researching the 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 channel or the production company that you're aiming for and making sure that because there are so many production companies out there and there will be some who are really excited by that more experimental, non-linear work. So right, as opposed to kind of scattergun approach, if you're quite targeted, you will you will kind of you'll find your kind of creative soulmates and they will be out there and there will be an audience and a platform for it. I think it's just a lot about that kind of research. Um, we've got a question here, which is, um, I don't know how to answer this one, but what is the um, most impactful media for telling a story? And Beth, do you want to have a go at this one? Oh, um, I don't. I, I mean, for telling wise, it, perhaps is it the biggest audience, or is it? I, I I wouldn't know. It depends on the story. You know, um, I do think if we rewind all the way back, and you, Roger was thinking about like how many characters, or you know, I think it's or we talking about theme. Is is thinking about what's the best thinking about the best platform for that story because whatever platform you're you're working with, you'll you have to think differently about the story and how you tell that story. Um I always think people go, Oh, I don't know whether it's this or it's this or it's this. And I'm like, well, you, you want to think about maybe where you want it to be, <laughs> whether it's a, a short film or a series or whatever it might be, TikTok, then then you will have to look at that in a very different way. So it's asking that question I would suggest. Yeah. So basically you could, if you don't get the right media for your story, you could have very limited impact. So it's about yeah. kind of marrying up, having making sure those marry up rather than a more cynical approach of this single media has the most impactful stuff because it depends on who you, yeah, who you want to reach. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, We've got another question here. I'll throw this one to you, Roger. Um, A big focus in storytelling has been around audience agency. To what extent should authors or writers address or enable agency in their stories? I I don't quite understand that. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know more about what that means. Yeah, perhaps... Um, 
Robbie, you could give us a kind of follow up question to further articulate what you're looking for there. I'll move on to another one. Um, we've got here. It's actually addressed to me, but I'm going to throw it to you, Roger, because you're the expert. You guys, you and Beth are the experts. So um, what <laughs> rules cannot be broken? Is there a rule that can't be broken? I, I, I don't think there are any rules that cannot be broken, except perhaps um, um, don't bore your audience. And that that <laughs> is a such rule. a loose rule because there are things that are going to bore some people and aren't going to bore others. So try not to, you know, but that's in a way, if you think from that end of things, you're doomed. You really do have to start with what you want to do and then let the, I mean, I've said it a few times today, I don't believe in the word rule, but let the, the useful constraints that other people and even you yourself and other work begins to demonstrate to you uh, modify what you're doing. So you may be very, very interested in showing somebody eat an entire bowl of soup. And there may be a film in which that's magnificent. But broadly speaking, it's not, it, it, it shouldn't occupy so much time because there's probably other things that people will want to watch. But other than that, who knows? I think I think just don't be boring is a fantastic rule. I think it should be made into law. Um, <laughs> we've got a really good, well, a really interesting question here around um, AI, and I don't know how kind of much you've looked into AI. The question here is around whether it should be considered a new genre and how we kind of critique AI. That might be sort of perhaps it's um, and I don't know how much you've kind of looked into AI. The AI is now generating stories based on a few simple prompts. So how you kind of balance um, a writer's intention with that AI, who's almost like a showrunner for the AI, and how much the AI has control over the story. So I just want to just kind of ask you a bit about about that and how and what you think about um, how AI is seeping into. Um, into media and what the potential impact of that might be as far as storytelling. Uh, Beth, do you feel that you can go, go there? Um, yeah, like um, I'm, I'm still trying to, for myself, kind of think about how I feel about it <laughs> um, and, and how I understand it in terms of for writers and as a tool. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say any kind of real opinion about it at the moment because I'm still kind of watching how this kind of plays out, um, mm -hmm. and and thinking about why why writers might use it as a tool as well. And have you got any thoughts on AI, Roger? Have you been tempted to to churn out your next novel? <laughs> I mean, using Chat GPT. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean. I, Oddly enough, as a sort of side light, as a teacher, this ha you know, I this has come up in discussions about whether students are using, uh, for example, ChatGPT in their not so much in their screenwriting as in the the journals that they have to write about, you know, uh, following their work through the year, um. As I guess vigilance is important. Uh, like Beth, I'm I'm cautious because, you know, on one hand, perhaps it's a little bit like the coming of sound in the nineteen late nineteen twenties. Uh, enormous amount of resistance to it. Now oh, we've got film right with silence. You know, sound is just a gimmick. But on the other hand, it does seem uh, like so many things to do with uh, internet-based uh, stuff. It it does seem 
to be a bit of a blur, a blurring effect on what really counts, which is that we are still flawed and uh, limited. I mean, you know, time limited humans. And um, that does, in the end, have to be the subject of art of any kind. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm genuinely unsure uh, what an algorithm can bring to that table. I suppose when when AI decides to write a story, then it has to draw on the rules, doesn't it? I mean, it must. Mm. I suspect it, it it follows the rules, but when it learns to break the rules and learns to bring specificity to a story that the thing that gives the story its kind of uniqueness I don't know if it's that advanced yet but I think that's when we need to be worried but the moment it feels like it's churning out sort of the tropes and the conventions of of storytelling and and I guess when it gets more sophisticated we we need to worry (laughs) yeah I think that's right I mean I think I think we also have to remember that there are um, interventions from elsewhere that have taken place before AI was even thought of. So, you know, I think of something like Brian Eno's, um, uh, uh, of course, I've now forgotten its its name, but the you can get an online version or an app version, um, Oblique Strategy. The sort of, it was originally a set of cards and I actually had the app on my phone and you just it shuffles uh randomness into your into your creative process and it can actually be incredibly useful so i think in that respect as a disruptor rather than a creator um these things can be very very stimulating i think we've got time for just uh one more question before i'll ask heather to come back we've got quite a few in the box but um there's a question here, um, which is quite a fun one, I guess, around subgenres. And if there's a subgenre that hasn't yet been done or hasn't been discovered, um, or perhaps uh, is is it is it do we is it an endless choice of subgenres? It, can we just create any at any time, or do they have to kind of earn their place in the, in the kind of film lexicon? And Beth, do you think is there any kind of anywhere we can't go with subgenre? Why not? <laughs> oh, but you know, like I would never want to say no to. And it comes back to me saying about playing, you know, play, see what you find. And I think that's with, with if we kind of on all everything, it's like play with the genres, play with your characters, see who you find. We were talking about research and your own experience. Play, can you play with those things? And, and what's the relationship between that? So I feel like, you know, I would never want to say, no, you cannot mix those genres or subgenres. Because who knows, you might do it and it's actually really brilliant and fresh and 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 takes us somewhere that we haven't been or allows us into somewhere that we haven't been before you know sometimes it can be the in so yeah play see what you find and actually just before I wrap up I just had one question around kind of and this is a more practical question um for anyone who's kind of thinking now well I I know the fundamentals (laughs) I know where to but how do I kind of go about getting it what are the kind of if you could quickly summarise the steps that you go from, um, and I know each journey is different for every writer. Some writers might go from kind of beats to or post-it notes on the wall or do a timeline or do some character biography work. Are there some kind of top tips you can give to writers, tools um, that they could have, that, that free tools for developing their idea on the, on the page? Mm-hmm. Um, Roger, I'll start with you and I'll get some off you, Beth, as well, if that's yeah. all right. I, I would say um, there's there's a, a really good one, uh, which um, I certainly didn't invent, which is the relationship map. I, either on paper, or there are various tools you can use on on, uh, on a machine as well, um, where you find out what the dynamics are between the characters. Because in the end, that's where drama comes from. It's not from a person doing things necessarily. That's only part of it. It's what happens between the people that 
creates the drama. So that's something you can do with, you know, a pen and a big sheet of paper right now. And uh, it can be incredibly useful, not only in showing those dynamics, but also because you can literally physically step back from it, seeing who is perhaps your main character, which can lead you to a sense of point of view. Thank you. That's really useful. And Beth, do you have any kind of techniques or tips you've seen the way writers develop their stories? Yeah, I think, I think you know, we... I, I, like I, I'm just kind of thinking about it. you know we talked about beats and and mm. post its and things like that, and I, I I want you know for me sometimes I think it's it's finding small ways. Oh look, the lights keep going off. Um, small ways into being able to write about a character, so or about your world. So finding kind of exercises to ask questions about it. So you know people want to hit the page so I'm always thinking about ways in which kind of keep you away from writing the whole thing but actually allow you to feel like you're writing and exploring the characters so you know it maybe is if you're looking to kind of tell you tell them on a micro level you know you tell a small how quickly can I tell this story so that you're getting into the routine of rewriting and asking questions and looking at where that conflict is within that moment maybe and who the character is and what this is really about but keeping it micro at first um, is maybe one way in. Great, thank you. That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Beth and Roger. I'm going to hand over to Heather now, who's going to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, really insightful and interesting, and and I feel grounded now. Actually, after um, two weeks of talking about AI and God knows what, you know, to actually go back to the fundamentals of story writing. So, thank you very much, guys, for that. I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to get a little bit of a kind of overview um, just to wrap up the festival. Now, um, we've talked about building story worlds um, in a traditional way, but we've also talked about how a story world is important in developing games and VR experiences and non-linear, uh, interactive, immersive, um, and how much agency you give your audience within that story world. Because depending on the medium you're using, um, you know, it might be that you would give an audience more sort of free will or less depending on where your story sits, what the objectives of the story are, um, and, and what, you try, what you're trying to get uh, your audience to do or to feel. And it's interesting that throughout the entire festival, um, although we've talked about all this different technology, it always comes back to this sense of connectedness with your audience and the sense of them feeling some element of magic or empathy, um, you know, or, you know, and having that sort of connectedness with either the writer or um, other people within the story. We've talked about giving audiences too much agency, and I, I used the example earlier, actually, um, that Bright White gave us, which was where they created a VR environment um, for their audience to go and play, um, and they had put a whole bunch of props in the room um, in the hope that the uh, audience would look at those and learn the elements of the story. And of course, because by giving them too much agency, there was a hole in the window and they just literally, the audience, every single person came in, took the props and chucked them out the window <laughs> because that's what people like to do is be disruptive. So, you know, we looked at how you can play with agency within um, these different media, but actually, you know, actually how much agency do you really want to give your audience and how much do you want to steer them down a path? We've talked about AI and its uses and the, the worries of AI as well. You know, it can be used to create literary reviews, to do research, to do a lot of the donkey work, um, to kind of set the scene in terms of the notes for a writer uh, and do a lot of that legwork for you. But it, it, it also, we looked at the dangers of AI and the ethics um, of, uh, you know, sort of intellectual privacy, um, you know, the role of the creator within that, you know, AI basically regurgitates what it's fed um, and it is getting very sophisticated now with chat GTP4 um, and it will continue to do so. And, and there are a lot of um, heavyweights at the moment shouting about stopping the experimentation until we understand the gravitas of what we're actually creating. <laughs> In fact, uh, Sharon Matthew, who's the head of AI Tech UK, was talking about the fact that with um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, without the ethics in place, you end up with an animal you know you, that you are literally can't control and so looking at the um you know the the advantages of using ai but also the concerns um that we're just feeding this machine at the moment and also looking at the fact that 
you can use it for doing a lot of the donkey work. In fact, AI um, now can you can write code, you can write C sharp in an Unreal Engine for virtual production using AI. You don't need to know code anymore. But um, you know that th there are consequences to that. You know, it, it, you know, if you're trying to predict the future based on um, an uh, um, artificial intelligence that's gathering information from a biased internet, for example, then you're creating something which is also biased. So you know, really um, understanding that in the, and its role in the future of storytelling. So we've also looked at things like interactivity, um, you know, what, you know, non-linear stories, stories where the audience gets to make choices, branch uh, narratives, um, and you know, right back to Ian Livingston's books, you know, fantasy books where you you, you know you go up the hill or you go in the cave, um, and we've got looked at that right through in terms of um, what's now being produced. You know, you've got the popular Bandersnatch, but also you know what other things are now being developed that are slightly less traditional to um, the kind of branch chain um, model and, and how that's evolving as well. So that's been really interesting. And what else have we looked at? Video games and how, you know, you're looking at your 90 minute film. Video games on average are usually played for hundreds of hours um, and people don't seem to get sick of them. You know, they become addicted almost, you know, and it's like there's a, this, an iterative story that continues on and on and on. Um, and the fact that video game uh, technologies now and engines are now being used in things like virtual production uh, to create these amazing backdrops um, and to save carbon footprint, uh, to save money in the long term um, and to create effects that you could never get before um, when making films. So looking at the interaction between games engines and video production, um, virtual production and how that's affecting uh, digital storytelling now and going forward as well. And uh, even things like Ludo narrative dissonance um, and how you look at these different um, different modes of telling stories and how they translate across different platforms. So you might have written a story that was designed as a book and someone that makes it into a film and then someone makes it into a video game. And if they don't, if, if, they, if they don't flow and if there aren't similarities between all of those different elements, then you get what's this what's called ludonarrative dissonance. And it means that your uh, audience feel uncomfortable. They feel that something's not quite right. We've talked about the uncanny valley, which is where, um, again, you're creating things that are not quite right, you know, within these technologies. So you're, you're creating artificial intelligence characters for example which you're putting in films or in games but they're nearly there but they're not quite exactly right and 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 what that causes in the audience you know how that affects the audience and their their enjoyment or believability in or escapability and, and getting into that flow which is the state they need to be in to really kind of escape into the story so we looked at that and how you can get around that and that's just a few of the things that we've covered over the last two weeks you know we really have to, had a whole whirlwind tour around so many different media types um, and so many different ways of engaging audiences and telling stories right from the you know 30 second TikTok clip right through to the 300 hour video game and everything in between and it's been amazing um, you know if you haven't had a chance to look at the sessions please do they're all available on northerndigifest.co.uk um, and, you know, there's so much really amazing and useful and current information there. You know, if you want to get ahead of the game in any of these areas, you know, and just to get up to speed with all of these latest technologies and how they are impacting in the future of digital storytelling, then I do urge you to have a look at them and tell your friends uh, and family and spread the love because they're all available there for free. Um, we've tried to make the festival as inclusive um, and as accessible as we can. We have an audience from all over the world most of whom are from Britain, but we have actually, I looked at a map from the website um, this morning because I've got to write a report on this. And um, we've actually, there were very few countries we haven't actually hit with this festival, you know, so, so, and, and I expect as well that when we, um, when we, we you know, with the recordings as well, we'll have a, as big a reach um, after the event as we have during the event. So, you know, that's really fantastic for me. I, I, my intention was to spread this as far and as wide as we could and to affect as many people as we could with the knowledge and excitement and interest in this really uh, interesting space. And it is moving, technology is moving so fast just now. So just keeping up to speed with that is a job in itself. 
but understanding how to use those different tools and technologies to craft even better stories and understanding where that creativeness and creative people, the creative imagination can work best within all of that so that it is all about the story because the story is king and queen. You know, it's it, it, it doesn't matter how good the technology is. If your story's crap, it doesn't matter what platform it's on. It's never going to make it any better. So, you know, back to, the, which is why I was really pleased that this was our final session, you know, really back to the craft itself. Um, you know, what are the core elements that need to be within that? You know, what are the key things that you need to consider as a writer um, in order to make sure that your story is the most adaptable and the, the, the you know the strongest it can be in order that it does actually play out across as many uh, different platforms and different elements um, as it can possibly be. So it's been a fantastic blast, and um, I want to say a massive thank you um, to to my regular attendees. Thank you so much, Olivia and Robbie, for your zillion questions, your indefatigability over the last two weeks. It really has been um, fantastic, and, and a big thank you to Adeline, Jazz, Maz, all of you. Really, um, you know, um, oh, thank you, Maz. So Maz is saying she wants to say a great big thank you to, to us for the whole event. Every session she's managed to get to has been informative and inspiring of new stories. In particular, thanks to me and Maggie, thank you very much for emceeing everything and keeping us all engaged. Um, she'll be looking at the website and sharing it with all our creative friends. Thank you very much, Maz, I really appreciate that. And so, yeah, so it's been really great. Um, we've had different people in all the different sessions um, from in many, many different wakes of life and from all over the world. Um, we've had academics, we've had businesses, we've had creatives, we've had theatre goers, we've had all sorts. So, um, yeah, I'm ready for a very large glass of wine now. But before I do that, I must say a massive thank you to our sponsors, the Screen Industries Growth Network, Sign who have sponsored the event and without them we couldn't have run such a great festival so my heartfelt thanks go to them um, for allowing us to to run such a great festival it's been in planning since before uh, Christmas um, and I'm absolutely delighted with the quality of the talks the quality and caliber of the people who have been involved um, and before I go I want to say a especially massive thank you to Maggie who has been here all along doing all the social media and plugging the festival and spamming everybody um, and also has been here as my tech support as well as um, the person that's got a shoulder I can cry on when everything breaks. So um, I really do appreciate your support as well Maggie so a massive thank you to you as well. It has been really fun and you have done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And on that, before I get all embarrassed, <laughs> I'm going to close the session. I'm going to say a thank you to everyone um, and uh, have a great, yeah, have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you to you lot very much.